today, uh, as you see, I don't have many uh, slides, but I do have a very heavy subject, uh, which is in fact my major uh, subject. So uh, I feel more comfortable when you ask questions. Uh, so we will be discussing about microscopy today. Um, let's see. And this subject will be throughout the uh, this course. So the, there are more parts coming when you go later on, uh, neural structures and neural function. So this is, a tr I'm trying to give you a fundamental basics of microscopy. So let's see. How many of you have actually used microscope? in the past or right now, okay. Who haven't used microscope? Okay, good. So most of them, of you guys have used, so that's great. So, so today I will be discussing on the magnification and resolution. Think about imaging and microscopy. What you care, hey, I've got a microscope with a $10. I have a microscope of $100,000, which is in our lab, okay? $10 microscope, $100,000 microscope. What are the differences? So we usually care about, hey, how, how, how magnification, how big magnification do we have? How small details can we see or how fast can we see? So those are our interests, okay? So magnification and resolving power on the other way, we call it as a resolution. And we will discuss about parts of a microscope that will affect these parameters. And today, we will be talking about fundamental parts of light microscope and how to magnify an image. And relative strengths and limitations of common forms of microscopy. And later on, this would be uh, this Wednesday, microscopic image preparation and analysis. This is uh, like when you are uh, performing your research, uh, especially imaging involved, and you want to publish your image, microscopic image and analysis, I'll be discussing about how to publish and how to prepare for you to prepare an image data and an analyze them. So first, light microscopy. So, um, by using the light or photons, uh, this is the most uh, versatile communication tool for us to ob observe information from outside of the world. So obviously light microscopy gives us a, a, a very important tool for studying any subject and object. So there comes a bright field, which is just a, a normal bright light, okay? And a field means light as an electromagnetic wave and that light as an electric field, electromagnetic field is coming from here. And there's another thing uh, I'll discuss about phase contrast. And this might sound a little bit weird, uh, but the light as a wave, then you hear about the phase concept in wave propagation. That's where this phase comes. And everything about imaging is about how to create and deliver and analyze the contrast. And there's a tool for dark field, uh, which literally means that you see everything is dark. Like when you are getting into a um, movie theater, everything's dark. And then you only focus on what you want to see, okay? and differential interference uh, contrast. So this one is, uh, you can see, or we call it DIC, or uh, based on the inventor's name, Lomarski uh, microscope. So this is about interference. So as we say, light is an electromagnetic wave. And you remember from your middle school, high school physics course, and when two waves are coming together, you see they sometimes constructively interfere or destructively interfere. So 
here comes that interference and why differential interference we'll talk about it later and the later part of today's talk uh, we will be talking about fluorescence microscope okay how many of you uh, who haven't seen fluorescence uh, images okay who have actually taken taken fluorescence images okay mean some you you haven't okay all right so fluorescence microscope is something a little bit more advanced than typical microscope so here I will be discussing about so-called epifluorescence. Epi means surface. Confocal and two-photon laser scanning microscope. In fact, confocal is confocal laser scanning microscope. You have to know that. Two-photon is two-photon laser scanning microscope. This will be dealt in next uh, lecture. And TIRF, Total Internal Reflection Fluorescence. You remember what TIR is when you have a, in the airport, you put your finger uh, print and that's detected based on by TIR. Okay. And then electron microscopic data will be covered next time. Let me start with the uh, a history of microscopy. So in the uh, 16th, uh, I think 17th century, uh, there's Antoine van Leeuwenhoek uh, who lived in this, uh, at that time, Dutch Republic. Uh, he was a draper, which is sells a, cl a clothes, okay? Sells uh, fabrics. And you know he in in Netherlands at the time he was interested in watching the small thread of this. So there was a concept of a lens, you know, which is a glass. You you grind them curved, then you realize you can magnify. So he is the one who actually sells fabrics, but he watches different kind of fabrics. He actually invent made by himself make a small tiny lens of magnification. It's just one single monocular lens. And, but he's now considered called as a father of microbiology. Why? Because he's the first one to watch these tiny things. You can see maybe amoeba and red blood cell. And even he watches red blood cells uh, passing through capillaries the uh, first time. So he invented a simple microscope, which has about 200 times of magnification. So with that tool, he actually uh, observed, described microorganisms. For example, muscle fiber, bacteria. Bacteria is about one micron size, and he actually uh, be able to see small bacteria. And sperm, okay, and blood flow in capillaries. How? Here's the, uh, the picture of his tool. You can see here, looks like a very crude um, uh, toy, but let's take a look. There's a rebag, and you see this tiny one? This is a lens. And you have to uh, attach a, a, your sample at the tip of this, uh, looks like a needle. But microscopy is about you know, microscopic world, we move this so big. So you have to move very much precisely. So he has to use this uh, um, bolt to translate uh, the sample. So you look at this one. So by using this, he can translate sample this way. Okay. And, but it's very important to put the sample in the right focus of the, of the lens. So how you do that? You look at this one, uh, this uh, actually this knob to move this sample front and backwards in, with respect to the uh, lens. So 
I think you guys can even invent this. So here, a diagram for this rebat, and you see this screw or this one is actually focusing screw so that you can put in the right focus. And in this case, uh, in the lateral direction, we have only one XCR uh, translation because he already made the pins. Uh, let's say this is Y direction. The X direction is already fixed and set. So that's why he only needs one direction. So look at this and imagine that you can create this. You know, it's, it's pretty simple. All right. In the contemporary time, <laughs> there is another uh, English natural philosopher and architect and polymath. Polymath means a, a person who is very knowledgeable in various fields, okay? And, and that his name is called Robert Hooke. Uh, he was in the contemporary time person, and but he actually used a more advanced type of microscope. It looks like this. So it's a little uh, more complicated. So it's called compound microscope. The definition of compound microscope means it doesn't use only single lens. It uses, uses more than two or more lenses to create a microscopic imaging. So look at that. So this one has at least more than two lenses inside. And you know, when you are using a microscope for the first time, you look at tiny things to magnify. So you need enough of a light. So you need to actually focus light from the outside. Look at this. He uses a big uh, transparent ball as a lens to send the uh, a light, which is a, a fire, okay, a flame to focus on to the sample. So that's how he uses. And this is an example of cork tree, and he watches this. And actually, this is a cross-sectional view. This is trans, uh, transverse view of this. And he was the first time to watch and name it, OK? Um, so let's say, uh, Zui, can you guess what he actually coined the term of this? from the cork, does it look like what? The grip. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's actually cell. You look at, in fact, we call cell in when, when let's say someone is a, a, a prison, you know, a prison, prison, the room for prison is called the cell. Remember that? So, it looks like a prison, okay? So this is called a cell. So he's the first one to actually coin the term we call cell biology, cellular mechanism, those cells. So, and later on, he actually published a book uh, called Micrographia. And that's the first book with insects and plants with microscopes. So that's fun, uh, but uh, so the Leuven hook who invented the first uh, microscope, but he didn't write any books, but uh, he was regarded as the father of microbiology because he, he observed many for the first time. Robert Hook, but uh, later on, he actually coined the term cells. And also he wrote a book which contains many of these, you know, tiny, tiny objects. And because this is a neuroscience technology, I have to introduce you uh, over and over Santiago Ramon E. Cajal, uh, who, is, who was living in 1852. So this is him. And why he's coming so many times? Because he's the father of modern neuroscience. Okay? He was a Spanish and um, he was in actually a painter he was a very rebellious uh, uh, nature. So he was even in, uh, uh, in prison at early days because he used a cannon to break down the neighbor gate, okay? Uh, so he was uh, not a regular, like, you know, easygoing uh, student. Uh, that doesn't mean that I ask you to be rebellious to me, but, um, but the important thing is he had a uh, kind of, a, he wanted to become a painter. Okay, and his father tried to correct his uh, misbehavior, okay, attitude. 
and so uh, make him to work with a barber shop, work with a smith, uh, okay? And then at the age of 16, his father brought uh, Kahal to a graveyard and, and give him a cadaver, you know, dead body, and to watch the anatomy of this. Actually, this triggered him to become a medical doctor. So he's an MD, but with a skill for drawing. So how does this artistic skills or sense helped him to become a modern neuroscience father because of his skill? So he was using a microscope, which is a single-eyed uh, one, and while observing a X geometry of neuronal uh, tissues, he actually being able to create a nice detailed uh, diagram. So although his microscope at the time was not the best one, but he was able to draw this. You see what this is a uh, so-called hippocampus uh, the section. And you see how detailed he was trying to draw things and even make an arrow to see the structure and arrows. At the time, he was using um, a staining technique called the Golgi staining, uh, which is uh, Camilla Golgi, who was um, claiming that the neuronal network, which is connected as a network. Uh, but Kahar, careful with his careful observation of this detail, he actually considered this neuronal structure, uh, this structure is composed of neurons with a very diverse types of different kind of cells. And while he cannot observe the connection, which is so tiny, but he actually proposed a, hey, this structure is composed of cells, distinct cells, and the connection between the cells, that's his proposal. And they both actually uh, kind of fight each other in terms of, and they actually shared the Nobel Prize together at the time. At the time, it wasn't reserved, okay? So what his uh, claim at the time was a relationship between nerve cells was not continuous, but they are connected touching each other, adjacent each other. So this is called Yu So yes. what do you call by this? Neuronal doctrine. Exactly, that's a neuron doctrine, okay? Sungyeong, can you guess what this is? Continuous. That's here, not continuous. Continuous was claimed by Camilo Golgi, who is an opponent of Kahar. Yeah, this is a little bit difficult, maybe terms that comes in GRE exam. So that's contiguous, which means they're, they're like adjacent in Korean, in Japan. So that contiguous claim means that they, these are not connected physically. These are each individual neurons. Okay, so that's a neuronal doctrine. Okay, so now let's move on to microscopy and uh, neuroscience. So light microscopy has a magnification up to uh, 1,000 times. So where comes this number? So when you look at uh, your microscope, there is an objective lens in Korean, demo lens. So you can see the magnification written there. Usually that's, let's say, uh, 4x, 10x, 20x, 40x for air. But sometimes you can go up to 60x and 100x. But where comes this 1,000 times? So your, your eyepiece, your ocular lens, you look at on the side, usually write down 10x. So that multiplies by 100x times 10x makes it a thousand, up to thousand. That's what you can observe in your bare eye. Okay, so my microscope uh, can see the structure of a cell and microenvironment. 
and which is uh, you know light is usually not very harmful to the sample or even living cells. Fluorescence microscopy is a, a revolution in microscopy because what you want to see there there are so many things intertwined and so complicated. So there are too many things involved. When you want to see only very specific ones, you have to somehow label them to have an outstanding contrast. So how you, you can highlight individual subcellular structure by use of fluorescence. So the invention of fluorescence is uh, an enormous step because it gives you specificity, okay? When we move on to consider electron microscopy, um, so, you know, light microscope uses light. Light is a wave, electromagnetic wave. So wave is having this, you know, wavelength and phase and propagation. So you can consider this wavelength as a ruler. So the resolution by using a medium of light is about comparable. Usually we say half of the wavelength. Then you can ask a question, how to improve resolution? Hey, light has only 400 to 700 nanometer for visible light, which we can see with our eyes. Okay, so your resolution is only about half of visible wavelength, which is down to about 200 nanometer. Hey, how can you overcome this? Another question approach is, hey, why don't we use the smallest possible wavelength on Earth or in the universe? That's a good way. So on extreme cases, actually electron. As the name calls, it's electron is a particle, but from the Nobel Prize in concept of a metal wave, even electron has a wavelength which is a tiny, 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 so that you actually can use electron as a uh, microscope. So that magnification is actually even more, which is even thousand times more than this, so up to a million times. So what I call this electron microscope, you can get down to even nanometer order. Okay, so what does this nanometer mean? Uh, we'll uh, think about the scale, a spatial uh, scale of this, uh, spatial scale of the object in neuroscience. So such as synapses, okay, you know, synaptic cleft, the gap between pre and post synapse, remember what the gap is, which is only about tens of nanometer, okay, which is impossible to resolve with a light microscope. Receptors, Hey, these are even tinier, okay? It's less than 100 nanometer, a small protein machines and this protein. So that's actually good for, with the target for electron microscopy. So then we can have to come back to ask what's resolving power of microscopy. So here it comes. So I call it as a, a multi-scale uh, object in neuroscience. So let's think about the brain. So you, you actually watch the mouse. You, have, you guys all touch mouse. So mouse brain is about 10 millimeter up to. So that's mouse brain or red brain is bigger than that. And nuclei, which is a uh, um, collection of uh, neuronal cell bodies are about between these, okay? about one millimeter order, which you can even look at uh, with your eyes. And then think about neurons. And the neuronal cell body is only about 10 micron order, but the spread of this could reach about 100 micron order. So if you, people ask you a question, hey, what's the cell size you are looking under the microscope? Uh, you can say, hey, that's about 10 tens of micron size. but Interestingly, neuron has a very long projection. It can actually reach to several, even millimeter, which is 10,000 times, okay, thousand, a hundred times longer than and that their uh, neuronal cell body 
or even thousand times longer. Okay, and but this is a neuronal cell body, and you know that dendrites are over here. So that dendrite sizes are about ten micron order, and on the dendrite. You remember that there's a fine uh, synaptic formation with another neuron that we call dendritic spines. Okay, so this dendritic spine is the location of connection between another neuron, which is a another presynaptic uh, neuron, and that this neuron as a postsynaptic uh, spine. Okay, dendritic spine. So this size is actually now start to be under the micron, which is means you, you are having an issue with your typical microscopy to observe. So look at these uh, synaptic vesicles. You know, the diameter of synaptic vesicle is only about tens of nanometer. You will not be able to see with your live microscope anymore. While on the other hand, Nobel Prize winning super resolution microscopy in 2000 14 allows us to actually having more than order of magnitude uh, fine resolution because in in the past we only consider several hundred up to like 100 200 nanometer is was the limit of light microscopy but you know whenever you break people's or belief uh, lead you a revolution or even sometimes get Nobel Prize okay that gets down to tens of nanometer with a light microscopy. So be able to see this one even more closely. But now I would say this is really, you see this is the limit of light microscopy, okay? And the down is electron. So your native eye, naked eye can see brain and brain nuclei, but you cannot see the neuronal cell body with your eyes while light microscopy will not be able to see the detail of synapse, okay? Then get down, if you are interested in really even tinier world, you want to use electron microscope. So that synaptic vesicles and even ion channels, it's a smaller than 10 nanometer. And you know, when, when you are having an interview, let's say you're, you want to apply for PhD at uh, some great institution or you want to apply for postdoc and people ask you, hey, you did a microscope. So, okay, what's the size of DNA? Then you kind of have some idea that, oh, can you see DNA with your mi light microscope? Oh, actually DNA is less than a nanometer size. You, it's not easy to watch it with a light microscope. And you can go down to one angstrom, which is in hydrogen atom. So I hope this, uh, gives you an idea that the size of scale so you are dealing with. Okay, so what are the parameters in light microscopy? Uh, magnification, your naked eye can see and can perceive the object about 0.2 millimeter in size and larger. 0.2 millimeter is about 200 micron. Your eyes can perceive uh, like your hair the hair is about 100 micron uh, thickness, okay? So individual axons and neurons are actually tinier than that. So they need a re magnification to see. So magnification. So you need some lenses uh, to magnify. It. And magnification is one thing, but even more important thing is we call resolving power or resolution. So what's the definition of resolution is, I have a, a broad a picture over here. Hey, do you see there are two things over here? It's kind of hard to say, it's a barely, but here it's clear that you can see two objects. So what it means is an object as a two, but if they look like almost the same, like here, you cannot resolve. So that's how we define resolve resolution or resolving power. And why it comes like this? I have to say that if you have an object like this, okay, this is a um, 10 nanometer object, okay? But when you take a picture with a microscope, 
this 10 nanometer object becomes uh, about 100, 500, or even one micron, which means 100 times bigger. So look at that. You are, you are seeing this, but actually in your image, it looks like this big. Right. Now let me draw. OK, so this tiny point, this is the, the reality, but you actually see under the microscope, this like this big. So if you have two objects nearby, you actually see overlay between these big two. So what it means is you will not be able to tell there were two single particles. So that's over here, what happens over here, okay? So I want you to know exactly what's happening. If there are tiny particles, it is below your resolution. What you see is always the smallest size is your resolution. You cannot see below. So that's the point. So we define this uh, minimum distance between two points that can be separated with uh, your imaging uh, device. So then you have to ask question, hey, then what determines this resolution? Okay, uh, there's answer I have to explain you. When we are imaging, uh, there is always a medium because there's an object to image, okay? We have an imaging system and then we have an image. And what are we using to understand the shape of this guy in our real detection space? We have to use some kind of a physical medium to get information from to here to here. So typically, what happens in my eye, how can I see this? Is if I turn off all the light, nothing you can see. The reason why I can see this is the room light, the lamp photons get to, to hit this and scatters. And then that scattered photons get through my pupil. And then my pupil, my eye, there's a lens. So they actually converge this, this uh, photons onto my retina. So they focus on each different point will focus on as a point corresponding to the correspondence. I look at this, I can see this is an imaging. What am I using right now? I'm using photons and I'm using light as a wave. So that wavelength determines the resolving power. So which is here, wavelength of the light. The second one, okay. What about then, how many of you are having uh, photography? So how many of you are using, having your own camera other than uh, cell phone? Who have your own camera? Okay, Yunhe, great, uh, okay. Yunhe, I have a question for you. Uh, to have a sharp image, will you have a bigger lens or smaller lens? Um, you can get What kind of sharp image? Oh yeah, let's say you, you want to take a picture of a human, a nice shot, um, you have a choice of smaller lens, such as like cell phone lens. And you have another choice of big, huge lens. Which one will make a sharper image of the object person? A bigger lens? Exactly. Yes. That's the point. Okay. So let me mute you again. So what am I talking is, you know, when the light light is coming and scattered from the object, uh, this scattered light will contain information of this shape. If I use my eye, I'm using only about five millimeter size of my pupil to collect only the tiny angled information 
to create my images. That's why my eyesight has a limitation. But if I use Yun has an expensive camera, which has this big lens, that captures much bigger angle, wider angle, and then you put it into the detector. You will have a more sharp image. And this concept of, so then the question is, if you take more angle capture, you will have, of course, more information, and then you will have a better image. This is an, an important insight. We call it as a numerical aperture. So this class, I won't ask you to remember the formula, but at least you have to get the concept. So like Yunhe or I recommend everyone else, whenever you have a chance, borrow a great camera and you should have the concept of F number, okay? Bigger, bigger aperture has a smaller F number and that has a bigger numerical aperture, okay? And the bigger this lens size, you will have a sharp image and you have a great blurring of the out of sight. You remember a nice picture having focus and then total blurring outside. And that's the beauty of high numerical aperture or high a big aperture lens, which can be very costly. You can pay for a thousand dollars for getting this if you are a professional, okay? Okay. So for that, I want to, uh, sorry, I changed a little bit order to give you a, a better information. So light as a wave, you understand wave is a propagating in space and time. And this is spatial uh, valley to valley or top to top is called wavelength. But now, Let's get into the real fluorescence microscope you are using. So DAPI uh, is for a nuclear stain and it will emit the light at 460 nanometer. A famous GFP which got Nobel Prize, I think in uh, 2000 sometime, the invention of this makes it available for specific labeling, which is about 515 nanometer for enhanced GFP. FITC, um, if you are working microscope, this is green dye, okay? So it will emit about into this green area. And Psi 3 and Psi 5, um, this is a great dye. So it can emit about orange color. Psi 5 is almost uh, infrared range. And Texas red, uh, we are using this for labeling sometimes blood vessel that will give out the red color. Okay, so that's kind of a typical use of dye for fluorescence. And now I'm gonna ask you a question about here. So as I described, numerical aperture is very important for the resolution. Uh, so here, definition is very easy. So there's a lens, there's a focal length and a media N. So numerical aperture I define now here is a N is a uh, refractive index. Sungyeong? Uh, Sungyeong? Yeah. Okay, let me ask you a question. Uh, so refractive index uh, in Korean is a is the ratio of the speed of light uh, compared to the vacuum. So what's refractive index in vacuum? What? Exactly, good, okay. So what about water? Okay, you guys, uh, you remember when you put your, your straw through the water, it will bend. Okay, you learned from Snell's law. So it's good to know about the refractive index of water is 1.33. Okay, so what that means is numerical aperture is proportional uh, for the resolution. To increase numerical aperture, would you use uh, the sample and the lens, the media in air or water? Sungyeong, can you guess? Air. 
Which one would you prefer? Air or water? Water. Exactly. Okay, so you understand that because refractive index will, uh, I'll explain you a little more later, but numerical aperture will be proportional to the refractive index of the media and angle. I just describe angle with the Yunhe's uh, camera, okay? The bigger angle, the higher resolution. And you can have another effect of refractive index. The bigger refractive index, you will have higher resolution. And I, I think I can explain you on a later slide, actually this slide. So this can be confusing at the first side. This is objective lens. You can consider objective as a big lens here. And you have a sample here. You have microscope cover glass. Cover slip glass thickness is about 170 micrometer. And you have a sample here. And the left side is air. Right side is an immersion oil. So the thing is, from the sample through the cover glass, Oh, I have to explain you one thing about uh, Snell's law. So let's say there is there's a water and air. So if light goes of a leak angle, and this glass has a refractive index of 1.5, okay, and equal 1.5, okay. So when the light gets in. So what happens is Snell's law is about angle from the for perpendicular this angle. So it will bend towards the higher one. So let me draw this. Okay, this. So not this, uh, but this. This is what happens. Here is an air. When the ray goes in, it will bend toward high refractive index. That's the point here. So what I mean here is look at here. So this angle, this is air, then the angle will be going towards not this, not this, but this. So what happens is when I go to towards this angle, if I, if this is filled with the emergent oil, then I can send the light, oops, sorry. I can send the light toward the tip of this objective lens. And what happens? This will get into the system, we capture them, we get the spatial information. If I send the light to here, towards here, this is glass, so what happens is it will bend toward the outside and it won't be captured by the system. Okay, that's why refractive index it's very important to bend towards the optical system to capture the information, okay? So this is why re refractive index is important as in numerical aperture. So the question was why use emergent oil to increase resolution? I asked Sung Young about air versus water, water is better. Then the question is what about oil, which has refractive index of almost 1.5? Okay, then that would be even better. All right, so that's why, you know, it's a little cumbersome to use emergent oil, but when you need a higher resolution, you better to use this. And the question, why light microscope cannot resolve 0.2 micron or below, which is about 200 nanometer? And uh, the answer is you can only resolve uh, things about the scale of the medium you are using, which is light, especially visible light wavelengths is 400 to 700. If you divide it by two, that's a 200 nanometer. So you will not be able to see smaller than 200 nanometer, not object, but the resolution cannot be achieved. Okay. All right. So now the components of a compound microscope. So 
With this uh, basics in mind, now I want you to uh, understand the key components. So here is a uh, typical microscope in the laboratory. And uh, this typical microscope has two or more lenses. So especially important one is these ones, which is objective lens. Yeah, so with this online course, it's a little bit hard for you to touch and feel, uh, but this objective lens uh, is the most expensive part you have to remember, okay, in microscope. The objective lens sometimes can be itamana, like over $20,000 or $30,000. You know, it's a, this tiny one can be a, a, a very a expensive car price. So that's what why it's the core of the imaging. And sometimes this camera, if the camera is a very good one, uh, it can costly. So objective lens, you can see whole here, mercury lamp source. Uh, this could be a light source for fluorescence imaging. You send the light here hitting on the sample and then returning, which you can see with your eyepiece or you can change the path to the camera. So your eye will watch through this, we call eyepieces or this is called ocular lenses. So what about not fluorescence microscope, but the typical microscope you send the light through the sample. Then there's a light source at the bottom and they have to to focus the light onto the sample, there, so there's a lens underneath that's called condenser lens. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense for you. And there are of, uh, different types of microscope, light microscope. I want to introduce you two different kinds of microscope. Um, so you see here, objective lens looks from top to bottom. And here, objective lens is a bottom to top. So uh, this, which one is called omelite, which one is called inverted? Uh, okay. Shukla. So A and B, which one's omelite and which one's inverted? I have to guess. This is upright. You mean A is, A is what? Inverted. Ah, okay. Look at this one's inverted. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good guess. Uh, but unfortunately, this is called upright and this is inverted. So I can see objective lens is like this. So you can guess it as inverted. But this is called upright. The reason is uh, if there are sample, if we are coming from top to bottom, look at, which is called upright microscope. If we look at from the bottom to top, that is called inverted microscope. So this is a, a kind of naming uh, convention. So once you know it, uh, location of specimen and objective lens. So the important part is uh, when to use this, okay? Choi Yujin, when you have an in vitro cell culture, can you guess which one to use? Uh, which one will you use more preferably? Inverted or omelite? Mm. Okay, so uh, yeah, I think this question might be a little bit confusing, but the point, uh, let me explain the point. Uh, so you have a cell culture, the cells are transparent. Uh, you want to, usually cell dishes open upside. So if you, you can use omnite microscope, of course, but you have to uh, immerse the omnite microscope object into the cell media, okay? It can contaminate the cell. So what you instead would like to do is a cell culture dish, 
you want to see from bottom to top to observe. And the opened up side of cell culture dishes, you can throw like uh, media or you can throw some pharmacological agent. So this makes a uh, study easier. So when you have a typical cell culture dish or well cult, uh, cell well plate, you would use inverted microscope. I'm not saying that you cannot use on light. Sometimes you use on light, okay? But that's typical. Then I'll ask question, when to use on light microscope? Uh, this one is when you have a, let's say, brain slice, which is a very thick in terms of light microscope case. Sometimes it's difficult to pass through the light too. So in that case, let's say even more dramatic imp uh, uh, example is, hey, I want to watch mouse brain. So mouse brain to watch, you can shine light on the, on the underneath of the mouse to light pass through. So it's impossible. So that's why you have to shine from the top and you have to observe from the top. In that case, you have to use on light microscope. Hopefully uh, this makes sense when you are actually doing experiment. Here I have to uh, point out that your textbook has a wrong figure. So I'm going to just, um, you know, the author of textbook is not microscopist, so he can make a mistake. So here, so here's a specimen tiny neurons and there's a condenser lens and light source you focus on to the specimen and your objective lens will collect the light from the specimen and this lens will focus on to image plane. So that's an image plane, your magnified specimen should be here. So this is wrong, okay? And with this magnified specimen, you are using your eyepiece to magnify 10 times more. So another ocular lens will be an imager which observes this one 10 times more into your onto your retina. So don't trust this diagram much, uh, but just uh, accept the concept. All right. Now I want to discuss about stereo microscope. Okay. So, uh, so here is a stereo microscope. Many of the labs have this one, uh, stereo micro. Stereo means a 3D. So this has always two eyepieces so that it gives you something looks like three dimensional shape, okay? So the specimen appeared three dimensional and stereo microscope, a good one will have a light source from the top. You look at this LED light. So light shines on top and then observe that the, in terms of light path, it's shining on top and reflected back. And that light you are observing. So that's why it's called reflection mode, okay? But sometimes you have, let's say a tiny, tiny insect, okay? Uh, or like C. elegans, you watch it. Uh, sometimes you use a light from the bottom, which is lights from bottom passing through the sample and you collect. So that is called transmission mode. Unfortunately, very thick sample or opaque sample, you cannot use transmission mode. All right. So this stereo microscope is sometimes called dissecting microscope. And you want to examine surface of brains, surface of tissue slice, or gross neuronal, uh, neural structures. And also you can manipulate using this during dissection, surgery, or fabrication of small tools such as electrode or input. So this is very versatile tool. And just want to notice that, you know, your eyes great, but your eyesight is only temporary. So I always ask my students to take picture with your, your cell phone if there's nothing available, but some good ones have triocular port that you can attach uh, real microscope so that you can record because later on you actually have to show and analyze the images. Okay. So the first one is a light microscopy. It's bright field microscopy. It means light passes directly through 
that's transmission mode or reflected off, that's reflection mode. Uh, most cells and tissues are, uh, let's see, Hanjinuk. Trans? Transparent. Exactly, most cells and tissues. So in fact, do you see my hand are transparent? No. Here, what I mean, most cells and very thin tissues, okay? But if they are thick enough, enough of the absorption and scattering makes it opaque and non-transparent. Or unless naturally pigmented, uh, such as blood, okay? Or artificially stained. And thus distinct structures are very difficult to dis differentiate with bright field microscope. Those who have done cell culture or will be doing, uh, uh, trying to observe uh, neuronal primary cell culture, you will see cells with your eye and very difficult to observe, okay? Because they are mostly transparent. Thus histological procedures to preserve and stain or, or paint the specimen to enhance Jinuk again Exact. Sorry. Contrast. Exactly. Contrast among different microscopic structures. So why did I emphasize this? You realize all different types of microscopy techniques are all try to reveal and enhance specific contrast. All right. So. For example, how to impose contrast without any fixation. As I said, you could like inject a dye into the bloodstream so that it reveals a blood vessels. Uh, but without those fixation, how can we get contrast? Well, this is a this is question that hey, we use a physical property of the light interacting with the sample. There we can get devise a, a clever way to uh, get contrast. That's what I'm gonna explain you uh, next slide. I have to say, this is a little bit uh, complicated. So uh, just bear with me. I want to show you these uh, pictures. So A is a bright field. As you see, you cannot see very well, okay? This is called bright field. That's conventional light microscope. And the second one, is in fact, we divide a way to convert the phase differences into, uh, let's say, Yangunha. Can you guess what this is? Not are sure, you? but intensity. Exactly, very good answer. We are using light as a wave by interfering them. Some become bright, some become dark. So. Uh, this is called a phase-based contrast. In fact, this led to Nobel Prize in 1953 uh, by a physicist who are working for cell, uh, looking into the cell. Okay, You're, this is a way without doing any fixation. That's why he got Nobel Prize. Uh, Jornitz, okay. And then C is called DIC, differential interferometric contrast. And look at this, it look almost like a shade in one direction. And so you look it into almost like kind of 3D appearances and you look at the edges, it looks much cleaner and sharper. So it highlights edges because it gives a, a shadow, right? And the last one is, you see bright field has all bright background, which is not giving good contrast. So a trick is, you have a sample, you send light this, and you observe from the top, you, you, you get all the light. So that's why this has a bright background, but why don't you send the light this way? Sight, then that majority of light will not get into microscope, so majority will be dark. Only the light scattered off and interacting with the structure of the cell will show up into the microscope. That's called dark field, so that's using oblique illumination.